I'm going to be reading some quotes that are like a little bit intense, and um, there's a lot of us, you know, probably in this room who've been through some sort of trauma, and it might be kind of near and dear to our hearts. And if at any point during the lecture you kind of feel like you just don't want to be here because there's some type of emotionally charging material that we're going through, you won't be docked any type of like attendance points or anything like that. Judge you. Before I get started, um, I kind of want to just introduce a little theme about what I'm going to be talking about, which is essentially in science and in a lot of the studies on, in this university, we often look at how you know nature is affecting us, how the way we're born, essentially the DNA that we have in our bodies. Um, we have a mouse and we alter a certain gene and that mouse has something wrong with it. Or we study essentially how genes affect us, how, how different things we're born with. I think this lecture and kind of the theme of this class is to also recognize that you know we are products of our environment and our world. And actually, our environment is changing our internal biology. So. With that, I'm going to get started. Okay, so the title of the lecture is called Psychological Trauma of the Brain and the Emotion. So, the first thing I wanted to do was I really wanted to kind of go into what trauma is exactly. Um, and I was lucky enough to take an amazing class called The Psychology of Trauma with a um, professor named Professor Zerbergen, and she's here today. And she introduced this amazing book, and the book is called Trauma and Recovery. Um, this book, for me, really helped me understand what trauma is about. Um, it really opened up my eyes to not only the psychological perspectives of trauma, but also the biological perspectives of trauma, and helped me connect a lot of ideas. And I just wanted to read this quote to you guys, because. For me, this was something that kind of gives me shivers and is really powerful. Psychological trauma is an affliction of the powerless. At the moment of trauma, the victim is rendered helpless by overwhelming force. When the force is that of nature, we speak of disasters. When the force is that of other human beings, we speak of atrocities. Traumatic events overwhelm the ordinary system of care that give people a sense of control connection and meaning. And you know, really what we have to ask ourselves is what is the result of trauma in a human being? And there are several different outcomes um, depending on who we are, depending on the biology that we're born with, depending on the severity of the trauma. Um, Someone could go through something very intense um, and essentially have almost no reaction. There could be other forms of psychopathology, including post-traumatic stress disorder, which I'm going to be talking about in detail today. Um, there is another disorder called dissociative identity disorder, which where it's somewhat unclear whether it comes exactly from trauma, but it's also known as multiple personality disorder. And I won't be going into that today. There's personality behaviors. People who've gone through tra trauma are more likely to kind of exhibit addictive behaviors, um, especially with alcohol and other drugs. And there are other changes in behavior after someone has experienced trauma. And you know, when I say almost nothing, there is there, there has been documented that when when a human being goes through something that is um, intense enough, there almost sometimes there will be some type of reaction. Um, I'm going to be talking about post-traumatic stress disorder because for me this, this really represents how a single event in our environment and how a single event in our lifetime can really alter the way we behave, the, the symptoms that we exhibit as human beings. and. Um, <coughs> What it is, is it's a severe and chronic psychological illness that manifests um, following a traumatic event. 
Um, the DSM defines trauma as like a threat to one's bodily integrity and the actual threat and death of the self for someone close. And there's three kind of clusters of symptoms uh, in post-traumatic stress disorder that I'm going to go through with you guys that, um, that I kind of you know, picked out some of the biology of the different ones that I thought were really interesting. Um, there's hyperarousal symptoms, which is kind of like an autonomic nervous system response. There's constrictive symptoms and intrusive symptoms, and I'm going to go through what those are. So first we have to look at, you know, what is occurring during, you know, during, in the body during trauma. Um, in the lecture we had on the brain-body connection, Austin and Henry um, went through what, what fight or flight is, and so we kind of know, but essentially what we need to remember is that the resources that are in our body essentially are being diverted away from non-essential functions like our digestive system or our immune system or different parts of our brain um, that we don't need. And parts, and you know, essentially the, the parts that we need like our muscles and our heart rate and um, different uh, brain regions that are controlling breathing are increased to increase like our chance of surviving um, uh, a really intense circumstance. And we just have to remember that it's, you know, the sympathetic nervous system which is in charge of this. So, I view hyperarousal as this kind of, this first cluster of symptoms that I was talking to you about earlier, of PTSD, as kind of almost a continuation of fight or flight. Often, um, when someone has PTSD, kind of the smallest reminder of the trauma can set this um, bodily process into action. And um, I thought we would just look at a little bit of the biology. And I, these slides are going to be available on my feedback, so don't worry about like writing every single word down. But essentially, we can. Um, I wanted my laser pointer today, but we can look here, and we can see that. Um, this is the physiology of what's, you know, really happening. And the things that I really want us to take out of this is that um, the anterior pituitary gland is essentially releasing these different horn hormones called um, cortitropin-releasing hormones, CRH and ACTH. And this is causing the release of essentially three uh, hormones and neurotransmitters. So adrenaline and norepinephrine are really involved with essentially um, metabolizing sugar and sending energy to the muscles. Um, the, that comes kind of from the inside, what's called the adrenal medulla, which is the inside of the adrenal gland. And on the outside, we have the adrenal cortex. And this is where, for me, um, things get more interesting. Um, because the outside of the adrenal uh, is called the adrenal cortex, which is releasing a substance um, substance is called glutocorticoids, and I'm going to explain to you guys what those are. Right. So we did talk in the kind of brain-body connection about what glutocorticoids are. Um, it's a little bit misleading to say glutocorticoids because there's actually only one endogenous glut glutocorticoid, and that's called cortisol. Other glutocorticoids are like when you go to the hospital, when you have poison oak, they prescribe you some sort of steroid medication like prednisone or cortisone. Um, but essentially, we can look at this structure right here. And when we went over our biochemistry lecture, we can kind of remember that although there's a lot of like charged um, atoms on here, like these oxygen molecules right here, essentially, this molecule is a lipid. It's a fat. And essentially, it can almost go straight through our lipid membranes because um, it's able to just bypass because it's so like hydrophobic. But what I really wanted to get at was that cortisol is released during trauma and cortisol is changing our brains. Cortisol causes neuronal degeneration and death of, hip of hippocampal <coughs> neurons by blocking the entry of glucose and essentially reducing the reuptake of the neurotransmitter glutamate. So does anyone remember um, from our neuroscience lecture what the hippocampus does? Memory. memory. But what is it like exactly doing? It's converting short-term memory to long-term memory. Um, a guy at Stanford named Robert Sapolsky um, essentially also did research and he found that 
the surviving neurons in this hippocampus have less branching, and they have less, essentially, the dendrites of those neurons have less connections. Um, and they also found that these neurons are undergoing neurogenesis, which is essentially, um, there's less neurogenesis, which is the replication of neurons. Well, neurons don't do that very often. Um, studies have found that neurogenesis does occur in the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is in charge of converting short-term memory to long-term memory. And you know, what does that mean? Well, when you look at someone who has post-traumatic stress disorder, not in every single case, you will actually see a reduction in the size of the hippocampus. And um, for me, this is, this is really incredible because how is it possible that literally just a psychological event that's occurring um, or something that has not been actually um, physically traumatic to our brain, but has been mentally traumatic to our brain, is affecting our brain physically. To me, this is, when, when I learned this in Professor Zerbergen's class, to me this was something that was profound. And I said this was so profound of how our environment is actually shaping our physiology. And just to give you guys an idea, so this was a, this was a study from um, uh, a guy named Bremner, and he essentially was able to measure the volume of the hippocampus using magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. And I'm not a, you know, a radiologist, so I don't really understand this exactly fully, but I wanted to show you guys what I found. This is showing you the location of the hippocampus right here, and this is showing you kind of what the structure of the hippocampus looks like, which is why they're only referring to one side here, because it actually comes in on both sides. So the question is, you know, why are we talking about, you know, what does this have to do with, you know, the symptoms of PTSD? Let's, let's get kind of cycle a little bit. Sorry. Well, when essentially we reduce the size of the hippocampus, when we're in this kind of, when we're in the midst of trauma, often what happens is we become kind of dissociated. Um, and we can imagine the metaphor essentially of this fox right here with the rabbit in its mouth. Essentially, when we're going through something so brutal and so hard that we essentially have to dissociate. I'm going to go a little bit more into this, but it's essentially when the organism is in a total state of surrender. I'm going to show you guys what that has to do with the hippocampus in a second, but I wanted to read you guys a quote um, from Trauma and Recovery, this book. This is written from a feminist perspective, and, um, you know, it's... I don't really have an opinion on why it's written in that way, um, but that's the way it's written. It's a really beautiful book. When a person is completely powerless and any form of resistance is futile, she may go into a state of surrender. The system of self-defense shuts down entirely. The helpless person escapes from her situation, not by action in the real world, but rather by altering her state of consciousness. Analogous states are observed in animals, who sometimes freeze when they are attacked. These are the responses of captured prey to a predator, or a defend in constant battle. A rape survivor describes her experience of this state of surrender. Did you ever see a rabbit stuck in the glare of your headlights when you were going down the road at night? Transfixed, like it knew it was going to get it. That's what happened. In the words of another rape survivor, I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. I was paralyzed like a rag doll. What does all this essentially have to do you know, with the hippocampus? Well, when we're in this kind of like absolute state of surrender, we've actually noticed that there's a correlation between this brain structure of the hippocampus and the psychological phenomenon because when during surgical stimulation, of the hippocampus, um, neurosurgeons have actually found that dissociative states arise in patients while they're awake during neurosurgery, and this is happening. Um, the other piece of evidence is that there's a, pharma there's a pharmaceutical drug, a Schedule II substance called ketamine, and ketamine is a dissociative drug, and it binds to so what's called an NMDA receptor, and it antagonizes this receptor, which means blocking that receptor. 
And you know, if you've ever seen someone on ketamine, essentially they kind of are dissociated. They're kind of like staring off. Um, just so happens that these NMDA receptors are primarily located in the hippocampus. So this is kind of giving us evidence that you know all this stuff, all these brain changes, these psychological phenomenon that we're talking about are correlated together. And I wanted to just, you know, point out one last thing here. You know, why is this happening? Why is, during trauma, why are we essentially, like, leaving our bodies when things get so hard to bear with? And I think this is the slight philosophical part of this lecture, you know. But we could look at it from a scientific standpoint and say, well, um, maybe this is happening because the organism will increase its chance of survival if it's physically relaxed during some sort of like really harsh physical trauma. Um, maybe there's some other reasons. Um, I'm going to read you another quote um, from Herman. These perceptual changes, combined with a feeling or indifference, emotional detachment, and profound passivity in which the person relinquishes all initiative and struggle. This altered state of consciousness might be regarded as one of nature's small mercies, a protection against unbearable pain. If we're no longer confined to the physical body, and I'm no longer in my body, there is no physical pain to be experienced. And you know, when, when Herman talks about a protection against unbearable pain, nature's last mercy, I don't know, that, that doesn't sound like, that doesn't sound purely like science to me, that sounds like something else. You know, it, it brought up something for me, you know, when David was talking about, in his physics lecture, about essentially when we observe matter, when we observe these electrons going through this particle field, and it changes the way they react. We break down this wave field, this wave pattern, and we are changing the matter. I kind of feel like that's when the true kind of fabric of the universe is shining through. Is it really like Darwinian? Is it really like survival of the fittest? Is it really, you know, all of this stuff when it's nature's last mer mercy, protection against unbearable pain? I don't know. You decide. Just a thought. <laughs> So another state of post-traumatic stress disorder that I'm going to go into less um, is called intrusion. And this is where the traumatic event is relived over and over and over again. And what happens is, is that the traumatic moment, according to Herman, becomes encoded in an abnormal form of memory, which breaks spontaneously into consciousness, both as flashbacks during waking states and as traumatic nightmares during sleep. So normal daily activities can become very difficult when we're going through these three symptoms of PTSD, which are hyperarousive symptoms, this autonomic nervous system response, this constrictive and avoidance, and these intrusive symptoms. Um, I'm just often, when I'm reading trauma and recovery, I'm just kind of like touched by what an amazing writer she is. I wanted to just give a few statistics um, about PTSD. Um, one in seven US service members returning from Iraq and Afghanistan suffer from PTSD. Um, a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder is essentially increasing the probability of suicidal thoughts and actions. Looking at these graphs right here, this is showing that most of our current treatment right now, um, in fact, 42% of those receiving treatment, um, this is from the Institute of Mental Health, the National Institute of Mental Health, 42% of those receiving treatment, it's minimally adequate. And this is looking at the overall prevalence of PTSD, and we can see that 3.5% of the U.S. adult population will at some point in their lifetime develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and I read another quote um, that I don't know the source of, but 
Um, another quote was that one in three people with PTSD don't respond adequately to kind of current treatments that we have. So, as I was taking this class two years ago, you know, to me, something, I was learning more and more about this organization in Santa Cruz that is essentially doing this kind of novel research for PTSD. And um, I'm going to change the slide. Oops. So essentially, what I was struck about by this study, which I'm going to tell you about, was the results they obtained. Downtown, there's an organization called MAPS, and they're sponsoring research using MDMA, um, assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. And essentially how this worked was um, there were two or three sessions of psychotherapy in combination with MDMA and normal therapy. And essentially, I was most struck by the results that were obtained in the study because in the 20 people that they, current, that they treated, and it was about five years ago, 83% um, of them no longer met a diagnostic criteria for PTSD. So this is a nice infographic that I got from MAPS. And you know what this is essentially saying is that the results of even one session, just this one life experience, just like this one traumatic event that changed our behavior, just this kind of one treatment was actually making a difference. Um, so the actual study, what happened was there were two sessions, three to five weeks apart. And 83% of the participants, it was something like uh, 18 or 19 of them, essentially no longer met a diagnostic criteria. And if you have some questions about it, I'm going to be going through this. So I, I took this video from CNN, and I thought it was a good overall description of what the work MAPS was doing. Shut it down. For Rachel Hope, the mental agony it was on guard. It just wouldn't stop. Couldn't shut it down. For Rachel Hope, the mental agony began in childhood when she says she was abused and raped at age four. As a grown-up, the smallest trigger, like a familiar smell even, would bring it all back. I would get, um, you know, just like very extreme stabbing sensations in my body, you know, and then like fixed vision, vi visuals, like being, for instance, raped. Mental breakdowns, four hospitalizations, and along the way, Rachel tried almost every treatment in the book tried EMDR, rapid eye movement therapy, uh, hypnosis, gestalt, yell it out, scream it out, you know, nothing worked. And then she discovered an experiment run by Dr. Michael Midhofer. He's a psychiatrist in Charleston, South Carolina. This is the place where we do the study, this is where we meet with people, and then this is where we do the MDMA sessions. Intense psychotherapy, including eight-hour sessions, after taking a capsule of MDMA, of ecstasy. Now listen closely. On this tape, you can hear Rachel, along with Dr. Minho. I really need to keep adding, keep adding. It felt as if my whole brain was powered up like a Christmas tree. All at once. Sometimes, usually people did have some very positive, affirming experiences, but a lot of the time it was revisiting the trauma. It was painful, difficult experience, but the MDMA seemed to make it possible for them to do it effectively. Within weeks, Rachel says, about 90% of her symptoms were gone. And in results just published, Dr. Midhofer says that 14 of 19 patients were dramatically better more than three years later. The question is, okay, was this just a flash in the pan? Did people just feel good from taking a drug? So the answer to that turned out to be, no, it wasn't just a flash in the pan for most people. Now, of course, 19 people is still just a tiny study, but it is getting attention. <coughs> Sutton was the Army's top psychiatrist until she retired in 2010. I've certainly reviewed it, and the results look promising. It's like with the rest of science. We'll apply the rigor, we'll follow where the data leads. We'll leave our politics at the door. Now, I point out that none of this means that street ecstasy is safe. 
apart from being illegal, you don't always know what you're getting. It's often contaminated. Pure MDMA can cause a higher body temperature, it can cause dehydration. There's also cases where people overcompensate and actually die from drinking too much water. But in a controlled setting, which is what we're talking about here, the evidence does seem to suggest that it can be safe. And Midhofer is halfway through a study offering this treatment to combat veterans, firefighters, and police officers. Dr. Sanjay, good to see CNN, report. So currently, this research is being um, conducted, uh, funded from Santa Cruz, essentially a mile away from here. And, you know, for me, this study that was done, although it was done with a small number of people, um, I would be reluctant to use these words if I was writing a scientific paper, but it, it seems incredible. Um, it seems unprecedented. It seems really promising. What I was struck with when I heard about this was I was kind of less interested in the fact that they were using a scheduled substance, and I was more interested in the fact of how it was possible that they could essentially cure someone of this disorder or you know, get close where the where the the trauma survivor is no longer meeting a diagnostic diagnostic criteria for PTSD, and that not not only do that, but then essentially cure someone, but then not only do that, wait 41 months where there's no MDMA, where there's kind of nothing in between that point. I'm sure there's normal therapy that's occurring, but there are no drugs being administered, and then essentially these results are maintained. How is that possible? Like, that is not how Western medicine functions. Western medicine functions by going to a psychiatrist who will see you for 15 minutes at times and prescribe you a medication that you will take daily. So we're gonna talk more about that. But I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it. And then I remembered that I read this book. <laughs> And I said, I think I have a hypothesis about what's going on here. And so the rest of my presentation is kind of what I've been working on for the last two quarters of really trying to understand what's going on here. So first we kind of have to understand what is MTMA. Well, there you go. 3,4-methylene deoxy and methamphetamine. Um, we can see here that it's called a phenethylamine, because we have this ring structure right here, which is called a phenyl group. And then we have this extra carbon sitting on the side chain here, which is called an ethyl and an amine. Um, it's an amphetamine derivative, so it's related to drugs like methamphetamine, and it's related to drugs like, um, you know, people take for ADHD, like Adderall, Ritalin. Um, it's different, it's quite different but um, they are related, it is related to those compounds. Um, and DNA is classified as what's called an intactogen. Um, this was a, a term derived by a guy named David Nichols, and he's a chemist at Purdue University, who is actually one of the only, um, who's actually the only man in the entire United States that has a license to synthesize LSD and do research with it. But, um, essentially what it comes is that this name came from these kind of feelings of empathy that MDMA produces and this safe feeling that someone gets from MDMA and it comes from Greek and Latin roots N which means within and tactos means to touch and gen means produce so um, I thought we would just I, I you know I said well you know if I, I really want to understand if I think something's changing in the brain like I think I really have to understand you know, what MDMA is doing in the brain from the different studies that have been conducted by all sorts of the spectrum, by people who, you know, really believe in MDMA, who people believe that MDMA is toxic. Um, essentially, th there is an agreed upon mechanism. But essentially what happens on a very simple level is that MDMA is being reuptaken by the presynaptic neuron, which is this one right here. Okay? And, um, what that causes is a large efflux of serotonin in the synapse. And on top of not only causing serotonin to be released into the synapse, 
It also um, works somewhat like an antidepressant too, where it's actually blocking the reuptake of serotonin, which means in this presynaptic neuron, in this presynaptic neuron right here, um, we can see that it's actually blocking serotonin from being taken back into this synaptic terminal right here. And what that means is that there's gonna be more serotonin left in the synaptic cleft to bind over and over. So, you know, what is serotonin binding to? What's happening in the cell? Well, um, since we did do electron molecular biology and biochemistry, I thought we would go a little bit deep. And we can actually see that these receptors are called G protein coupled receptors. And all I want you guys to get from this is, I want you guys to memorize that name because it's really cool. <laughs> and I think G protein coupled receptors are really awesome. But um, <coughs> this causes a cascade of signaling to occur in the cell. When there's extra serotonin, it's binding to this serotonin 5-HT2A receptor, which is classed as a G protein coupled receptor, which is causing different types of physiological changes within the neuron that we're going to go through. So, you know, I did some more research about exactly what neuroplasticity was, and, you know, so far in this class, I think probably you guys think that neuroplasticity is limited to um, neurogenesis, which is the birthing of new neurons, and long-term potentiation, because those are the two things that we've covered. But, there's actually a vast variety of how our brain is changing at every moment. Right now, as I'm talking to you guys, there's new connections that are being strengthened. Your neurons are growing out. And so what I would talk to, we have synaptic plasticity, essentially is what we went over, which is called long-term potentiation, which is essentially the strengthening of the synapses. And we have long-term depression, which is the weakening of synapses. So we can imagine when we're learning, if there's something that's maladaptive in some type of way, um, we're going to be weakening that synaptic connection. Um, there's neurogenesis, which is the birth of new neurons. It's very rare, but it does occur in the hippocampus. Synaptogenesis, which is essentially the formation of new synapses, which is actually happening. And there's something called dendritic spine remodeling, which is essentially these dendrites, remember the branches of our neurons are essentially like seeking out other synapses to form and are essentially remodeling their shape at every second. And this is all taking place in the brain right now. And we can also look, if you guys remember when we read um, the first chapter of The Brain That Changes Itself, Doage, Norman Doage would talk about brain maps. When we learn something new, we form these kind of new connectivity, this new connection of brain maps. You know, when I'm learning this slide, I actually created a little network of neurons in my brain that helped me to remember this slide. And so are you guys. So again, this is LTP. Um, I just want to remind us what it is, because it was a hard question on the midterm. So essentially, uh, what we can remember is does anyone remember what ion is responsible for the depolarization of an actin potential? Sodium. Yeah. So essentially, if we're inserting more sodium channels into the postsynaptic membrane, we have a higher probability of an action potential fire. And essentially, the brain map that we might have just learned is essentially gonna um, is gonna essentially light up. Because there's also something called Hebb's rule, which I think, um, I'm not sure if you guys read it in the brain that changes itself, but it's a rule in neuroscience that we've learned that neurons that wire together, neurons that are synaptically connected, fire together. Neurons that wire together, fire together. So the reason why I brought this up is because of these papers that I found last year. I think you mean the reverse, the fire together, wire together. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Okay. Perfect. But it's actually, it goes both ways. Yeah. It goes both ways. Which explain why. It does go both ways. Um, so, I found these papers last year that I thought were, were really fascinating. That essentially, when you take the hippocampal slice of a mouse or a rat, and you essentially put MDMA on there, we see increases. 
of LTP. And I'd say the majority of these two papers, this, this was a paper that was done in Italy. Um, and this right here was a paper that was done in Chile. These were both last year. Um, the entire papers were devoted to you know, proving the mechanisms that MDMA is increasing this LTP. Um, they claimed in this paper that this might account for um, some cognitive defects that are associated with MDMA. And um, I, you know, I agree, I think that's true. I think they missed a huge kind of section that maybe it's possible um, that this LTP that's occurring could be accounting for some of the recovery we're seeing in the MAP study. Um, just a hypothesis that I possibly have. What I, what I gathered from these papers was that at this juncture, the exact mechanism and the exact implications of long-term potentiation that we've been learning about that's induced by MDMA is unclear. Um, I found some other evidence too. So, you know, while a lot of the treatments for PTSD like are ineffective, um, there are some that um, do help. And there's something called an SSRI, which we're going to go more into on Friday when we have our lecture on psychopharmacology, but it's called a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And what essentially is happening is, like MDMA in some ways, the antidepressant, what it does is that it blocks the reuptake of serotonin with the postsynaptic neuron like we were talking about. And in this study, they found that there was an, a 5% increase in hippocampal volume from, uh, in PTSD uh, in trauma survivors. So again, this is increasing the amount of serotonin that's in the synaptic cleft. And if this antidepressant, which is increasing serotonin, is having this plasticity, maybe there's some plasticity that's occurring with MDMA. So, you know, I wanted to just like point out that um, it's probably, you know, if you just, if you had someone who experienced some type of trauma or anyone, in fact, and you were to just administer them this drug without any type of therapeutic setting, you know, essentially there would be no uh, positive reaction, most likely. Because what's occurring is that um, there's this comfortable, kind of aesthetically pleasing environment. And what they found is that mice who actually have been um, stressed out, who have been, whose, whose stress has been induced in these mice and rats, essentially when you put them in an enriched environment, they find increases in, hip, in hippocampal neurogenesis. Maybe it's possible that the combination of this therapeutic environment and essentially this, um, the substance that's lowering activation in our amygdala and essentially allowing us to process emotions is creating some type of ideal framework for recovery. Um, this was a paper that I found in Nature, which is essentially one of the most prestigious journals in all of the, you know, in, in all of science essentially looking and what they found is that other substances, including LSD and MDMA, also increase neuroplasticity. This was a study right here in Northwestern, and they found that a single dose of what's called DOI, which is essentially an agonist of the same receptor that serotonin is acting on, essentially increases this dendritic spine remodeling that we were talking about. This was a really interesting study that was done recently that I heard on NPR, and this was done at Yale. And this actually showed that um, rats who, you know, there are actually psychiatrists in this country who will actually, for people who are depressed, they will actually give a single dose of ketamine because it's a Schedule II substance and it's never really been studied like of how this works. But um, the researchers at Yale were curious of why ketamine was so effective and they found that um, there was huge amounts of synaptogenesis and spine formation, essentially, um, in the prefrontal cortex, in this kind of front part of our brain, after the administration of ketamine. So, I wanted to talk a little bit about what the the actual paper said. Um, 
about this. And MGMA induces um, not only serotonin, but as a kind of um, down the down the road a little bit in the um, in the reaction within the neuron, essentially there is a production of oxytocin, and oxytocin is a hormone within our body that is associated with bonding. It's associated with um, it's released um, for lactation to essentially help a mother and help um, to bond for bonding. And essentially that if this drug is releasing oxytocin, which it's been found to be doing, maybe this is helping to form a therapeutic alliance. Maybe there's some sort of therapeutic alliance that's forming between the patient and the therapist. Let's see. So also what it's been found is that, remember that we talked about in our neuroscience lecture, the amygdala is involved with fear. Something I didn't mention is that in post-traumatic stress disorder, there is kind of this extra um, activity in the amygdala. And there's this extra fear response that's occurring. And oxytocin has actually been found to reduce that activity in the amygdala. Um, this was a good quote uh, from, from Midhoffer's paper. And he said that frequently, however, treatment may, may be ineffective when patients are unable to tolerate feelings associated with revisiting the trauma or when emotional numbing during exposure to traumatic memories precludes the level of engagement necessary for extinction. Therefore, if the drug could tempor temporarily reduce and increase inter interpersonal trust without clouding the sensorium or inhibiting access to emotions, it might prove an effective catalyst uh, for psychotherapy for PTSD. So, I mention that. And I'm not sure if there's actually oxytocin being released in those lines right there. Um, I just thought it was a nice picture. <laughs> So, thanks. Well, it looks like I got through a little bit faster than I thought I was. Um, I wanted us to just kind of, for me, you know, just to look at the current, essentially, medical model that we have in this country, where essentially um, we prescribe a single medication every day. Imagine if there was some type of treatment for PTSD or other forms of psychopathology, you know, there's a lot of psych majors in here, where we could administer something once a year or one time. Imagine the amount of kind of reduced side effects that's gonna have if we're not introducing an external substance into our body every day. I kind of thought about this and, you know, when we have a traditional medication that's in our body, essentially it's modifying a certain behavior that's inside of us. And if that medication is stopped, then that behavior will most likely, then the, then the behavior that was exhibited before the medication was prescribed will come back. So to me, that's kind of evidence that if we're taking a psychoactive medication every day and we're not doing anything about it, we're not uh, going through therapy, we're not working through something, then there's probably not a lot of neuroplasticity that's occurring because when the medication is stopped, we're kind of reverting to that same state that we were in. Whereas this is different with this treatment that MAPS is doing. Essentially, there's a single um, two or three sessions, and a, a, you know the the patients, the trauma survivors, are no longer meeting diagnostic criteria. I thought about you know kind of this from more of like a psychological standpoint and a transpersonal psychological standpoint of, you know, there are these experiences that, that we have like in our lives that are like really impactful for us. And maybe that's a traumatic experience, like a near death experience. Or maybe that's, you know, it's something that we remember. Maybe it's like when our little brother was born or when our little sister was born or, you know, something happened that we can remember and it changed us. Um, has anyone ever had one of those experiences where we felt changed after it? Yeah. I thought about that sometimes, like in medicine, um, although I'm not a doctor, I do know that you know when we have an infection of some type, when we have some sort of body or we have 
perhaps a benign tumor that's not going to be you know, replicating out of control, that we can often cure physical illness in the body. So if there's a pathogen in my body, if there's some type of microorganism in my body and I'm administered antibiotics, um, that pathogen dies. And essentially, um, my body has undergone some sort of change. And if we consider that microorganism and my body as a single unit, and we then administer a medication at one time, which is, which is an antibiotic, my body has undergone, my system has undergone some sort of change, and there's been some sort of plasticity. And while this is not, I'm not trying to imply that the body is the same as the brain, I'm saying that there might be some lessons here, kind of the way like we treat illness. Oh yeah, and I wanted to also talk about um, a project that they're doing. Um, that we definitely will watch a TED talk on in this class later. But there's a project um, called the Human Connectome Project, where, um, like at this school, we were trying to map the entire genome and look at every single piece of every gene that was in the human body and map what those genes were doing, which we still don't know. But these people, essentially, um, at MIT, are trying to look at every connection in our brain. And while each one, each one of our genome is unique to each other, identical twins have the same genome, you know, how is it possible, like Henry brought up, that two identical twins have two different personalities, two different distinct type of interests, beliefs, experiences, behaviors? Well, it's because the connections in their brain are different, or at least we think so. Um, and the reason why the connections are different is because of this thing called epigenetics that we were talking about, of how genes are actually being turned on and off in our body, new connections are being formed. And they at MIT are actually working to map every single connection in the human brain. And they're not even close. <laughs> <laughs> not even close. They've, they've mapped the connectome of a sea slug, which is essentially, um, and the human brain is, something like a million times more complex than this brain of the sea slug. But what I was getting at is if you know one day we understood the exact connections in our brain, maybe when we had some sort of problem, we had some sort of you know psychological illness, we could just rewire those connections. Unfortunately, you know, we're not at that state. However, if we think about something that's being applied at point A helps us and then we maintain that kind of resilience at point B, I think we have to assume that something is changing in the brain. Um, I wanted to just say you know, one thing about MDMA, and that is that you know, it's not a safe drug. It's not something that you can just like go out and like, you know, just like do. It's not something that should be like recreationally abused in, in any type of way. And there is definitely some sort of toxicity that's occurring with MDMA. It's, it's said to be you know, controversial whether there is toxicity or not. I believe there is. I believe that if you were to take MDMA every day, you would have a vastly different brain than someone who didn't. With that said, the kind of scared toxicity related to MDMA seems to have been blown out of proportion. Who's ever heard of the idea that ecstasy puts holes in your brain. Well, um, those holes that they're referring to are actually fluctuations in serotonin. Um, they are not physical holes. And so this kind of result that was obtained was a little bit misleading. So there was a study done at John Hopkins University um, where Essentially, this result was obtained, where these physical holes were measured in the brain. And this cover of Scientific American, just, here is your brain after ecstasy. Well, as it turned out, there were more, there were more studies done that were conducted. This was, stud this was funded by the National Institute of Health. There were more studies that were conducted in Europe and around the globe, and kind of contradictory results were obtained. And some pressure began to mount on this researcher who would perform these studies because 
not only was there one or two or three or four, but there were multiple studies that were showing that these kind of like these holes, these fluctuations in the serotonin were not exactly correct. Um, there was so much pressure that was mounted on him that he was actually um, forced to make a public apology. And he admitted that he had mistakenly used methamphetamine in all of his studies <laughs> and not MDMA. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's something to think about. He said that it was not his fault and that it was the pharmaceutical company's fault. We sent it to him, the pharmaceutical company said, no way, it's not our fault, it's your fault. Who knows? <laughs> what, what did happen was that most of this room raised their hand and said they heard the expression, ecstasy put, puts holes in your brain. It's something to think about. What is this, you know, what is there, what, is there, what does this mean? Like, what does this mean that I'm bringing this up? A lot of what I told you, there's no direct evidence right now that MDMA actually increases plasticity. There's no direct evidence that plasticity is occurring in this process or this therapeutic process. Um, I think it really, really needs to be studied. There needs to be further research to look into, you know, essentially what is happening. And people need to start paying attention to what's happening because of this of these amazing results that we're sustaining. And I lastly, you know, wanted to say that, you know, my lecture here contained a lot of psychological data, contained a little bit of philosophical data, and it contained a lot of scientific data. And I think there's, you know, in general, I think this brings up bigger issues about kind of the system of medicine we have in this country and how sometimes we become kind of pigeonholed into one major where, oh, you have to be a psychology major or I'm sorry, you have to be a philosophy major or you have to be a history major. Well, hey, I'm actually um, interested in science a little bit or I'm a science major and I'm actually interested in psychology and if we look at kind of what's happening here is I, I, I'm studying psychology and neuroscience and there's no combined major. I have to stay here for five years and and double major. Um, but I noticed that a lot of my friends who are sitting in my psychology classes sometimes don't, I'm not saying I do to a full extent, but sometimes they don't understand what's happening in the brain. And I think it's really important for psychology majors to understand neuroscience. And that's part of the reason why we're teaching this class right now. Because I think most of you are not science majors. But then, on the other hand, I sit in my neuroscience classes. And I notice that these are the kids in my biology classes who will be going to medical school, who will be coming, who will be, be our next psychiatrist, who will be essentially performing this kind of medical model of prescribing these medications in a 15 minute appointment that doesn't appear to be activating plasticity, that just kind of appears to be um, introducing an artificial substance that you know, is making us feel better while we're learning the exact opposite in our psychology classes. And I think this is an opportunity for us to collaborate. I think on top of that, there's also a nonprofit organization that is less than a mile down the road called MAPS, which is doing this incredible research. Um, from, you know, from what I know, from the university or MAPS, there's really no collaboration or no recognition that either entity exists. And I think it's an excellent opportunity for us to come together and say, hey, you know, I'm studying neuroscience, I'm studying the brain, I'm studying physics, I'm studying psychology, whatever. We're actually studying the same thing from different angles. And I think there's more chances for collaboration. And I also think that in spaces like this, there's also more opportunity for student-led education. I'm not sure if I got every fact right in this lecture. And I'm sure I could have like been improved in a lot of ways. But this is a, a great opportunity for you guys to go actually teach classes on this campus. Essentially, I've told you guys this before, but I just want to remind you that any undergraduate student who is taking their upper division classes can go start a class. It's completely unknown on this campus. It's like a secret. At UC Berkeley, they have this vast system of decals where essentially people are really encouraged to teach classes and they have this whole event where all the students come together 
and uh, observe all the different classes that are being taught on campus. And there's probably over like 50 of them that are being taught at UC Berkeley. I'm not sure how many there are at UC Santa Cruz right now, but when I looked at the My UCSC portal, um, historically, there was about under four per quarter. And I think that we can step that up and we can start our own system. And on top of that, our system is even more powerful than the one at UC Berkeley because we have the power to teach five unit classes as undergraduates. And I think this is really um, a call to take education into our own hands and continue this collaboration. And I just really want to thank you guys for being here and thank you for taking this class and thank you for listening to me. Woo!